Now I am very happy to introduce our speaker for today, um, uh, Dr. Katie Kushminder. Um, uh, Katie is one of our own at UNU Merritt and Maastricht University. She is really an up and coming star in the area of migration and especially with regard to irregular migration and return migration. She's been working uh, um, in the area of migration and research for over 10 years. She's taught at many different levels. She teaches also at Maastricht University and UNU Merritt. She has uh, also trained uh, um, governments, international organizations around the world and led also a number of research projects and get them lots of policy advice. Katie has also won a number of prestigious research grants. Um, she run, won a Rubicon research grant um, from the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. And I'm very happy to announce that she also just recently won the very prestigious um, European Research Council starting grant, specifically to look at um, the reintegration and reintegration governance of returning migrants. So we're definitely going to be very excited and interested to see more of that work coming out. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of Katie's other accolades. She um, has done lots of work in this field and I am very excited that she is our first person to kick off the online, um, our online series today. And uh, today Katie is going to be specifically talking about um, migration in Libya and really looking at how um, Libya has changed from a transit route really to often uh, um, a containment situation or where people are also being stuck and bringing a lot more insight into that. So I'm very excited to hear more about that. Katie, thank you so much for being with us today. And I now turn the floor over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Melissa. It's um, a pleasure to be here tonight for the Maastricht Migration Lecture Series. It's a wonderful initiative and I'm really um, honored to be the first speaker this year to kick off the series. And thanks to all of you for joining and I hope you will enjoy the presentation. So as Melissa said, today I'm going to talk about migration in Libya. Um, and the title is from transit route to containment. In retrospect, this probably should have been from destination to transit route to containment, and I'll talk a bit more about that in the coming slides. I'm going to talk about three phases largely of uh, migration in Libya. So the first phase was prior to the fall of Gaddafi in 2011. And this is when, um, although Gaddafi was a dictator, there was relatively peace and security within the country. The second phase I'll talk about is the insecurity and the civil war period from 2011 to 2017. And then I'll talk about a third phase, which is really the post Italy the implementation and then the post Italy Libya deal in 2017, where we really see that transit migration stalls through Libya and it becomes more of a site of containment, which is the current issue that we see at present in Libya. So Prior to the fall of Gaddafi in 2011, um, Libya had a very strong economy fueled by the oil wealth. And many uh, people from different parts of Africa would migrate to Libya, often to set up businesses. So for instance, many Nigerians own their own businesses in Libya. They would work um, in their own shops. They would work as uh, technical assistants fixing different types of equipment. So it was uh, a good economy and it was a well-known destination center. You also had people from Eastern Africa that would migrate to Libya from, in particular, often women from Sudan or women from countries like Ethiopia would go to Libya in search of domestic work and they would uh, frequently have positions there. And the country's oil wealth really propelled this strong economy and uh, plentiful jobs. According to the IOM, there are approximately 2.5 million migrant workers in Libya before the conflict started. So quite a large number. And in 2011, when the uh, Gaddafi was deposed, 
when the Civil War started, many people started to flee the country. Uh, many people, you saw a surge of people crossing the Mediterranean Sea to Libya. There was a large number of people from uh, different parts of Africa arriving in, in Italy. And in Italy at that moment declared um, an emergency due to the large number of arrivals. And they put in special legislation to address this issue because of the war in Libya. But by the, uh, within two to three years, those numbers and those flows had greatly decreased and it stabilized in Italy. But in Libya, people continued to flee. At the same time, after the fall of Gaddafi, people from, other, from within Africa continued to migrate to Libya. And in 2004, since 2014, there has been a civil war in Libya. In 2017, there were three different governments that were vying for legitimacy and power. The first was the Presidential Council, which was established in October 2016 as the UN-backed central government. The second is a rival central government led by the Prime Minister, which had no control, however, over central institutions. And the third was a Tobruk-based former government that had been the internally recognized authority prior to the establishment of the Presidential Council. Um, as of mid-2020, so mid this year, there were two authorities that continued to vie for power in Libya, which was the UN-supported government national accord in Tripoli, and there's also an alignment of politicians in the east that were um, under the name of the Libyan National Army. So there was still not a consensus, and today there's not a consensus, and the rivalries continue. Um, and the conflict really has multiple layers to it. So it's not just that there's these competing powers. There's also numerous other groups and militias involved. There are terrorist organizations involved. So you've seen the rise of ISIS and also in Libya since 2014. There's rivalries between national, uh, nationalists and federalists. There's tensions between local tribes. And what we've really seen is a rise of tribal powers, which we'll talk more about in a few moments and also a role of competing outside powers. So Turkey, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Egypt, and NATO, the United States have all been involved in this conflict in different ways and have all been backing different um, actors. So it's created, of course, um, uh, a lot of insecurity and a slightly confused regime. And there's no, the result is really that there's no consolidated central control. And the um, problem with this is that different parts of the country now are, as I mentioned, really ruled by different tribal regimes and they control different parts of the territory and they control them in different ways. And this has had different effects for migrants traveling through Libya, depending on where they enter and exit. So we're gonna discuss that more in one moment. Um, but what's happened with smuggling in Libya is that smuggling has become an entrenched part of the economy. And it's a key revenue source that's used to provide protection to communities. So um, as compared to the fact that in many places, uh, uh, communities are often opposed to smuggling and opposed to having migrants come through the territory. Um, this has now been something that it provides very valuable revenues to people in the country and to communities that enables them to have protection. So communities have become much more supportive of it. Smuggling in Libya has comprised of four components. So it's weapons, migrants, drugs, and smuggling of goods. And what this means is that the smuggling of migrants has, of course, now become embedded with other illicit crime and illegal activities. Um, so it's just one component of what is happening. And there's also, this is also a lot of money is um, involved in this. In 2016, it was estimated by the European External Action Service that the annual revenues just from human smuggling in Libya amounted to 250 to 300 million euros for the year. So you can see it really is a key revenue source and a large piece of income coming into the country. So if we take a look at this map here of Libya, um, what it shows is it shows two things that are important. The first are the different um, migrant smuggling routes through Libya, which are demonstrated by the lines. And the second is the different um, tribal groups that control different territories. So first of all, there's four main smuggling groups in Libya. The first is over here on the coastal west side. And this is mainly with my, uh, has migrants originating from countries such as Gambia, Senegal, and Mali that travel through this route. The second is here on the southwest with Niger, and this is mostly migrants of Nigerian origin that travel through this route to Libya. 
Here in the southeast, we have the route from Sudan. This is mostly migrants coming from Ethiopia, Sudan, Somalia, and Eritrea. And then we have this northern route that's connected to Egypt. And you would see mostly people coming from Syria or South Asia that have traveled through Egypt to get to Libya. So you can see very quickly that there's different routes and different nationalities of migrants are traveling different routes to enter into Libya. And then what you can see here within the colors is that different uh, tribal groups control the territory. And today I'm going to talk about two entry points. I'm going to talk about here for Eritreans and I'm going to talk about here for Nigerians. And what has happened here for Eritreans is quite interesting. This is the Tibu territory. Um, the Tibu group is a nomadic heritage and they are a group that under Gaddafi was very oppressed. Gaddafi did not give them very many rights and their powers were often taken away. So with the fall of Gaddafi, they were able to quickly take over this territory again um, because they were very used to traveling already in illicit means and smuggling behind the backs of sort of Gaddafi and his military. And because of that, they, they knew how to smuggle and use the land. They quickly created control of this territory and they controlled all entry and exit into the territory. And by doing this, they created a monopoly and they were able to create a very systematic system for migrants coming in to kidnap and extort them for ransom payments um, before they allowed them to be taken north and pushed here towards the sea to Libya. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how that happened. And we're gonna compare that experience that Eritreans face coming into Libya compared to Nigerians that entered over here and had a very different experience. So, um, as I mentioned, the Tibu, this is their territory. This is how they've also had control, the different routes that they've used in between Chad, Egypt, and Sudan to control the entry and exit as to what was happening in and out of their territory. The data that I'm gonna share with you today is data that I collected in um, 2017. I did interviews in, in Italy, pardon me, with uh, recently arrived migrants from Nigeria and Eritrea. I did approximately uh, 39 interviews, and pardon me, 69 interviews in total, uh, 34 with Eritreans and 35 with Nigerians. The interviews were conducted in Milan, Rome, and Sicily, and nearly all of these respondents had traveled through Libya to Italy. One or two had flown um, directly from Nigeria to Italy, but the majority had all traveled through Libya. Um, they were, the average age of respondents was quite young. It was 25 years old. And in total between both groups, about uh, 21 um, respondents were female, so the majority of them were male. And all of the respondents had arrived in Italy between 2015 and 2017, so they'd had recent experiences in Libya. Um, first, I'll discuss the experiences of Eritreans. So Eritreans are coming from uh, East Africa. They travel through Sudan mostly, and then they enter to Libya into the Tibu territory. Um, the experiences that they, that they have in Sudan are very negative in that they're not allowed legally to stay in Sudan anymore. Many people report being accosted in the street in Sudan. They're not able to create a livelihood, so they don't see it as a viable option to stay in Libya, in Sudan. And this is where they travel into Libya. When they travel into Libya, they are very aware of the risks that they are facing. Um, they, there's no coercion, there's no deception, and, and they actually have very accurate information on the risks involved. Several respondents that I spoke to said that they spoke to family members or friends who had already made it to Europe, and they told them, don't go, don't do it, it's not worth it, we advise you to stay in Sudan, we'll try to help you, but don't put yourself going through Libya. So people were very aware of the risks that they were facing and what could happen, and people prepare for this. Um, as an example, um, men and women, they will often try not to migrate together, especially if they're married, um, because it's very well known that the woman may be raped. And if the man tries to prevent this, that he could be killed um, in trying to do so. So they often will, uh, husbands and wives will often separate to mitigate their risks in the migration, and they'll go at different moments, one a few months after the other, to prevent this risk. Um, women will often, you know, take the, um, get a shot for the, for the contraceptive um, to prevent being pregnant. 
And uh, sometimes also women will make decisions about which children they take with them or leave behind, with some people saying that it's better to have a, a young child with you because then you're less likely to be abused or tortured. So they're very highly aware then of the risks that they can face. And despite these risks, they really feel that the opportunities that they have in Ethiopia or in Sudan are not, um, not enough to create a, f a future life. And this, um, these are the feelings that prompt them onward to try to create a future for themselves. As an example, one man that I interviewed, um, to give you an example of the type of information they, they have, he said, yes, I had information about that and I knew that it was a matter of luck. I knew that I might get kidnapped or arrested, but one way or another, death is death. And I wanted to try something for a change. In my journey, I was afraid with every move I made because I might face something bad. But in the end, I was lucky. So people are aware of what's in front of them. And I think it's really important to note that and realize that and not to think that they're being deceived into these movements. So once they um, leave, once they leave Sudan, they are brought to basically, they'll hire in Khartoum a smuggler who will take them to the border with Libya. At the border, they sit and they wait until the um, Tibu militia will arrive. They can often wait for days until they arrive. Some reported that, you know, they um, ran out of food and water, had to go back to the nearest town and then walk back. Some people reported that it took two weeks until they were picked up. So it's different periods of time that um, they're waiting to be picked up. Once they are picked up, they're brought to be um, basically um, very uh, confined places. Um, they're compounds, essentially. Um, the migrants themselves will often refer to these as prisons, as jails, or the smuggler's place. But uh, from, what, from what I understand in the interviews I've done, this is quite different than being in a detention center today. Um, and these are very private compounds that are owned by the smugglers themselves. Within these compounds, different types of conditions were reported, um, but in general, the men were separated from the women, it, the pregnant and ill were separated from the healthy, and everyone was locked inside. Um, there's generally an air trained translator who tells the migrants that they have been kidnapped and that they need to call their families to pay for their release. They are ordered to phone their families and then they're given instructions for how much money the family has to pay and that they need to wire these funds immediately to the smuggler in order for them to be released. The amounts that they had to pay range from around $4,000 to $10,000 US. And if they were not paying, then they were beaten and tortured. Um, and they're forced to phone their families again and tell their families about what's happening to them until the money was paid. Um, they're often not allowed to go outside. They experience very poor hygiene conditions. It's a high prevalence of disease and there's a lack of food and water as well. So the conditions of, of course, are very dire. Um, if they are able to pay, then people reported that sometimes if they were able to pay, they were given special privileges like being able to go outside once a day for an hour until they were taken north to be pushed to the sea. Um, and other people reported that if they were able to pay very quickly, then their transit time in Libya could be very short and as, as long as only being in the country for three weeks. People who were unable to pay were often in the country for much longer, uh, nine months, 12 months, sometimes even two years. And a small number of the people I interviewed were not able to pay at all. And after just being um, held and tortured, they were still set, sent towards um, Italy. They still the, the smugglers let them go without um, having paid any fees. Um, but in other situations, I've heard that that is not always the case and that other people, um, they're just kept and they're not able to do anything um, to be able to be released if they can't make the payments. So um, the conditions here, of course, are not, are not good as they wait. Um, to give you a sense of, a, I'm sorry, I need to uh, change the slide there. Uh, one, one person also just explained further, you know, the smugglers, they choose a girl they like and make her stay for a year. And then they let her go whenever they want and choose another girl for the next year. You cannot imagine the feeling we had when we saw this, especially their husbands and brothers. The husbands cannot stop them because they immediately kill them if he tries to stop them. There's nothing you can do. So the conditions, as I'm saying, that they're extremely, of course, harsh and extremely difficult. Um, so 
Eritreans are experiencing what uh, we have uh, looked into further, and this is really a situation where they're being kidnapped and they're being extorted upon entry into the Tibu territory when they arrive in Libya. This is very different than for Nigerians. So Nigerians, you can see, I didn't have a better map, sorry for this, but you can see they're entering into this part of the territory from Niger into Libya. And for Nigerians, the situation is very different. Uh, the Nigerians I interviewed, uh, they were still going to Libya as their intended destination. So they were, when they left Nigeria, they were not planning to go to Italy. They were going primarily for looking for economic opportunities, and they were going towards Libya as an economic opportunity. Some of the people I interviewed were seeking to leave uh, Nigeria for other reasons, such as uh, terrorist attacks and not feeling safe in the country, but more, more commonly it was because of economic reasons. And when they arrived then in 2015 and 2016, the, experience, the situation they experienced was really a shock to them. It was really a shock to them. It was not what they were expecting. They still had this impression at that moment that Libya was relatively safe. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, there was a lot of Nigerians that lived very productive lives in Libya until the fall of Gaddafi. And some continued to stay on after Gaddafi fell as it continued to be safe and they continued to have businesses. Um, but for some people, the situation in the towns they were living in changed quite quickly as well. One man told me that um, after Gaddafi fell, he continued to stay. He lived with his family in Libya. And in 2015, ISIS came to the community where he was living and um, his child was killed in front of him on the street by ISIS. And as soon as that happened, he took um, the youngest child who was still there and he ran and he got his wife and they immediately went north to try to cross into Italy. So there's very different situations that people experienced. Um, for some other Nigerians, Libya quickly became um, also a because for they had not been there for a longer duration, maybe it quickly became more of a site of transit. And uh, I can give you an example of uh, one woman. She arrived and she was very, um, she was immediately imprisoned when she arrived in Libya and she didn't understand why she was being captured or why she was imprisoned. Um, and so she immediately thought, I just need to get out of this situation. And fortunately for herself, she was able to um, leave the prison quite quickly. The doors, it was not a, a locked in compound. She was fortunate to get out of it and she was able to escape. Um, and I can tell you also about a second case of a young man, his name, um, well, and we'll call him Emmanuel. That's not his real name, of course. Uh, he came to Libya with his, two, he was only 16 years old himself, and he came with his younger sister who was 13 years old and a younger brother that was seven years old. Their parents had died in Nigeria, they were orphans, and it was the three of them. And he felt that the only option for them was to try to leave Nigeria and go to um, Europe. So his destination was Europe at that moment. Um, when he arrived in Libya, he was captured and he kept saying to the captor, I don't understand. I don't understand why I'm here. And the captor said that the driver that they had hired to take them to Libya had not paid the necessary fines and that he would need to have more money to pay for their release if he wanted to leave the captive, the captor. And Emmanuel said to him, I don't have any money. I don't have any way to get the money. I don't have a family. Um, and the captor said, okay, well then, you know, you can pay off the debt. Um, the debt, he said, was 850 US dollars per person. And the captor said, well, you, if you work for me, then you can earn about $200 per month. So he knew that he was going to have to work for much longer than a year, one or two years, to pay off the debt for all three of them to be able to leave the captor. So we see a very different situation here than compared to the Eritreans. The Eritreans were systemically kidnapped and extorted for ransom. But here in this case, um, Emmanuel's being now held in a system of indentured labor. He was not expecting it. He's being held against his will. It was a surprise to him. He had made an arrangement with a smuggler to take him from one place to another. And that destination was interrupted by this indentured labor and being captured. So it's quite a different situation than what we see from the Eritrean migrants that I discussed a few moments ago. Emmanuel was really fortunate in the sense that um, the compound was bombed. And by the compound being bombed, the walls went down and he was able to escape. He was able to take his brother and sister and immediately they were able to flee. 
they looked for um, what they called a connection mound to help them get out of Libya. And um, Emmanuel said, we begged him, my sister begged him, and we cried and we told him our story. And finally he said, okay. He took us to Tripoli as his sons and daughters and from Tripoli he pushed us to be free. He says that day that we entered into the boats, I saw that they were bringing people out of the water, dead people, so I was very scared. I said, God, please show us the way, show us the way to Italy. Emmanuel was fortunate within um, a few hours of departure, his boat was rescued by um, a, a rescue crew, I think, I'm not sure which one, an NGO. And um, within two days after that, he was able to disembark in Italy. Um, so they were very fortunate to have that a relatively good experience on the Mediterranean Sea that would, of course, many migrants don't have. So what we can see here is that Eritreans and Nigerians, they have very different experiences of traveling into Libya and then within Libya on their journeys, the is very different. The Eritreans enter in the southeast. They expect and plan to be extorted in Libya. Libya is never their destination. It's just a part of the journey that they have to endure. And their stay in Libya really depends on how quickly their transnational networks can pay the extortionists. The Nigerians, on the other hand, they enter in the southwest. It's often their destination choice. So they have experiences of shock upon arrival. And they experience varying experiences of um, employment, detention, extortion, violence, terrorism, and smuggling through Libya. And they're often relying on local networks and local people to help them and support them in getting out of these situations. So um, just as to sort of summarize what's happened in, that, in this period of transit, I want to just reiterate that for Eritreans in particular, this is a situation of kidnapping and extortion. And kidnapping and extortion, um, when we look to the Rome statute, this is a situation of a crime against humanity. It's not what we think about typically as human smuggling, and it's not a situation of human trafficking. And if we think about this as a crime against humanity, what that actually means is that there is the responsibility to protect. And the Rome Declaration um, states that crimes against humanity include this imprisonment, torture, rape, enslavement, murder, and kidnapping. And the situation um, that we find then is very reflective of this. The crimes against, the responsibility to protect is a principle from international law that when we see a crime against humanity, states are obliged to step in and to protect people. And of course, we have not seen that, right? So if we were to utilize here the responsibility to protect, states should be stepping in to protect migrants from experiencing this kidnapping and extortion that is happening in Libya. Um, but we, of course, we haven't seen that. We've seen a very different response happening um, to the situation. And that brings us to sort of where we are today in the final stage, uh, which is really one, I think we can say, of containment in Libya. So why, what happened and why do we have now containment in Libya? Libya was, became, as you saw in the previous um, discussion, very much a transit route from, diff from different parts of Africa through Libya to get to Italy. And we all know, of course, that there was the so-called migration crisis in 2015 in Europe, but um, Greece and Italy experienced this very differently. And we can see here in this slide, the line in the green is the central Mediterranean route. And what you can see is that for almost four, for four years, Italy had very continuous and sustained high levels of arrivals. Um, during this period, between 119,000 and 181,000 migrants arrived in Italy each year. And it created this sustained crisis. Um, and the result was that, of course, with in what we had happening on the big peak in the Eastern Mediterranean with Greece, was here in 2016, we saw the implementation of the EU-Turkey statement, and we saw the effect of starting to reduce flows, which was largely attributed to the EU-Turkey statement. And in 2017, um, Italy said, well, then, you know, if this has worked in, uh, to the Turkey increase, then it can also work for us. And there was the implementation of the uh, Italy-Libya deal. And when the implementation of the Italy-Libya Italy deal, the number of arrivals in Italy be plunged quite quickly to only uh, 23,000 arrivals in uh, 2018 and only 11,000 last year. So significantly less than what we saw in previous years. And we 
You can see here what happened very clearly. This is um, from the UNHCR's report, Desperate Journeys, that the number of arrivals in here in blue, as compared to the interceptions and rescues by the Libya Coast Guard, completely changed. So the Italy-Libya deal, the main objective was to provide funding to the Libyan Coast Guard to detect boats as they were departing and bring them back to Libya. And um, the Libyan projects have received over 400 million euros in funding from the EU Trust Fund for Africa and an additional 98 million euros under the European Neighborhood Instrument. So a tremendous amount of money has gone into this. Under the Italy-Libya deal, the deal was made ex explicitly with the tribal groups in Libya that are on the northern shores to pay the tribal authorities directly to be preventing this movement. And today we see as a result of all these people being brought back, so the, there are a lot of people have been turned around after departure on the sea. Um, there's been, an, as a result, a strong increase in the number of detention centers in Libya. Most of the detention centers are clearly located in the north of the country. And this has been, I mean, a bit, very large issue in the news um, in which the, the conditions of these centers is really shown. So one um, really good source for this is from Sarah Kreta and her work in Euronews, where she has uh, demonstrated and shown um, the poor conditions in these centers where people are starved, they're tortured, they're completely unsanitary, they're overcrowded, People are used as slaves and they're sold as indentured labor on a daily basis. Um, and, and the list really, I think, goes on from there. That's just sort of the, the tip of it. Um, these also, there have been attacks on these centers. There have been airstrikes in which migrants have been killed. Last year, there was an airstrike where 53 refugees and including children were killed. So the conditions have um, been quite deplorable. And the response to this has been um, from the EU. Um, to increase funding for return from Libya. So there's been a large investment and the IOM is very active to offer assisted voluntary return for people in Libya to return to the countries of origin and continued funding from the Libyan Coast Guard. And if we look at the new migration pact that was just proposed, I mean, this, this sentiment is continued within the policies of deterrence and to continue to fund um, to avoid having more people to enter to the EU. Other stakeholders, We've had different responses of so the IOM and the UNHCR have both made several urgent calls for action to protect refugees and migrants in Libya, particularly in the case of the current COVID situation. There has been very little protection at all for migrants within the current situation. Um, in June 2019, the international, a case was brought to the International Criminal Court accusing the EU of crimes against humanity for the suffering and death of migrants in Libya and at sea. This case is still pending before the court. And there have been other interesting um, developments, such as if for those of you who may have seen, this is the Banksy rescue boat, um, the Louise Michel. And the specific purpose of this boat and why they bought this boat, which does not look at all like a typical um, MSF rescue boat, is that it was speed that it could actually go faster than the Libyan Coast Guard and get to migrants before the Libyan Coast Guard so that it could rescue them and take them to other rescue boats um, to save them and that they would not then be returned to Libya. So there's, we've seen these variety then of actions to try and um, protect against this containment. Um, if you're interested to read, I think further on this, there's also a very nice recent report by the UNHCR and the DRC Mixed Migration Center that just came out, um, I think two months ago. And it says, on this journey, no one cares if you live or die. And it provides um, more information about the abuse and protection of people along these routes through Libya. So coming to um, the conclusion then, I think that what we see is that Libya was once a destination for migrants, then it became a transit space of exception. And it was really a transit space of exception because there was a complete absence of rule of law. Without a central authority, tribal groups were able to enact different ways of treating migrants. They were able to have their own systems like we saw with the Tibu. It was very different than what was experienced by the Nigerians. And the country was operating not at all as one, but as very different experiences for migrants depending on where they entered and what happened to them. 
And now, with the result largely of the EU's policies towards the country, it's really become a site of containment. Um, there's no way for people to leave the country. And many, the majority of boats now trying to leave are caught by the Libyan Coast Guard. They're brought back and people are forced into the detention centers um, as a, where they don't have very few rights and very bad conditions. And what this also shows us is changing migration dynamics. So these are not migration dynamics that have really been seen before in the past. And they're not migration dynamics that are the same as what we're seeing in other countries today. Um, the situation in Turkey cannot really be compared to what's happening in Libya. And these changing migration dynamics, of particularly of what I've explained today about the Eritrean case, it's also a scale of kidnapping and extortion that we've not really seen in the past. There was previously kidnapping and extortion a lot in Egypt and in other cases, but this way that it was systematized by the Tibu in uh, this part of Libya is quite unique. So it's also bringing forth new changing ways of migration that we need to think about for the future and ask questions about how do we protect migrants within these situations? What does it mean for migrants when they arrive into countries like the EU after they've been through these types of experiences? We must understand that they've experienced different types of trauma um, and they're going to need support and treatment for this. And I think another point about this that is really important to say is that um, uh, we can't say we didn't know what was happening. We know very clearly what's happening. We see it very well documented by different um, organizations through reporting, through research, and in the news, and we're highly aware of it. And so it's really a place where we can't say that we didn't know, it's that we simply did not choose to act. And that's really what's happening today. And I think that this relates very nicely to what um, two authors, DeVries and Ansem, have called the politics of exhaustion on migration. And they talk about these transit spaces that have really become transit spaces of containment that are based on the politics of exhaustion on migration and that there's just no energy to tr that we recognize that these are human rights abuses, but there isn't really energy to manage and deal with them. And I think a second way that this relates is also to the work of Alison Mounts, which she calls the death of asylum. Uh, particularly in this case, if we recognize that a large group that I've been speaking about today are Eritreans who have a 98% recognition rate as refugees in the EU. So these are refugees trying to seek asylum and they simply cannot do so because they can't get out of Libya. So um, I think that uh, what's happening today is of course one that is very concerning to many of us in the field. Um, it's not one that we have um, solutions or answers to at the moment, um, but it's definitely one where I think we need um, more work and more action. And um, we, we can hope, I think, maybe that in the future that we will see differences in the policies and the treatment of migrants on this route. So uh, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you uh, very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions.